Hello, hello. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, so we have a special guest today from the Netherlands in the form of Aline Vidotto, who's an associate professor at the Leiden Observatory and at the same university. Um, so Aline works on, uh, as you could have guessed already from the title, Stellar Winds and the interaction with uh, exoplanets, uh, not stellar winds of, in general sense, but cool stars, uh, but solar-like stars, so not evolved. Uh, so to give you a bit background on Aline, uh, so she did her PhD in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. That's correct? Okay. So after that, she changed from the nice sunny Brazil to the cold St. Andrews to do a postdoc. Uh, four years. Uh, she then went on to Geneva Observatory uh, with a fellowship for two years. And then she came in 2016 to Trinity College in Dublin, where she became a professor, assistant professor first, then an associate professor. And meanwhile, she also acquired a ERC grant and she changed to Leiden Observatory and the university last September. Uh, so, without further delaying this, I will. It's a pleasure to give the floor to you, Aline, and hope you like it too. Yeah, thank you so much, Florian. Thanks for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. I moved to the Netherlands just nine months ago, uh, so it's nice to do a little bit of uh, traveling again. This is my first in-person talk. I, uh, let's uh, let's hope I still know how to do this. Since all this begin, this, this craziness started, of course, before that I gave plenty of <laughs> in-person talks. Right, so I would like to talk to you about how winds of stars interact with exoplanets. Now, before I start, when I say stars, I mean low mass uh, main sequence stars. And when I say exoplanets, I mean uh, closing exoplanets. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to be presenting today work done by a bunch of people, so I, I, I should probably highlight their names here. These are the important names for you to keep. Um, so let me start first talking about uh, these interactions. So we usually talk about um, space weather when we are thinking about the interaction between winds and planets. And this is essentially, um, I divide this in two different fields. So first of all is the radiation. So think of the stars that have, uh, that are emitting flares, they have high temperatures in the corona, therefore they also emit x-rays. And you also have the second component, which are the particles themselves. So this means this, this quiescent background stellar wind, as well as bursty events, such as, for example, coronal mass ejections. And together, the particles and the radiation, they form uh, the what we call very broadly a stellar activity and they shape the environment around exoplanets. So this is the, the, the environment your planet is embedded and so forth. This is the space weather they, they can, uh, that will, will affect them. Now, I mentioned high energy radiation and I mentioned winds, but one of the things we I would like to, that to show here is how the this and the these two concepts I mentioned evolve with time. I'm going to start first on the plot on the right. So when we talk about cool stars, there is a, a feedback loop. So we know that the stellar winds it carry away mass, but more importantly for low mass stars it carries away angular momentum. Therefore, the star starts to spin down as it ages. And if the stellar rotation is, 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 is spinning down, uh, is decreasing with time, we know that inside the star there is a dynamo operating that is essentially powered by rotation. And, and therefore, the magnetic activity of the star also decreases with time. And because the wind is dominated, is, is essentially driven by magnetic fields, you end up um, uh, also changing the wind, which carries angular momentum, and you then spin down, and therefore you have a loop that altogether, as the star ages, the high energy radiation in X-ray and in UV decreases. So you see here three tracks, and this is related to how the star was born, whether it was born as a fast rotator or as a slow rotator, but Without going into too much details, the thing for you to keep in mind, the first lesson is that the high energy radiation decreases with time. 
and um, in this left, uh, in the in the for you in the left uh, hand plot, you have the mass loss rate of the stellar wind as a function of X-ray flux. So as I already told you that X-ray is linked to age, you can think of this as being stars that are younger, therefore they have more X-ray flux, they are more active and they rotate faster, and this side of the plot are the stars that are older. And these are all the stars that we know <laughs> with mass loss rates in, in the low mass um, uh, main sequence part of the HR diagram. So a lot of these are just up li upper limits, but overall what we see is that as the star uh, is young and have high X-ray fluxes, their wings are also stronger and, they and the mass loss rates are stronger um, and higher and they decrease with age. Now imagine you have your planet orbiting a star. So now you're thinking about even uh, an older star, a quiet star, and just by placing your planet at a different distance, you the planet is also interacting with a different environment. So imagine you have your star here is a sketch of the sun and the earth, and the sun um, has this, the solar wind is essentially filling this environment around the earth. And if you compare the environment at this planet here versus the environment of this closing planet, you see that the stellar wind is a lot denser here, the, mag the ambient magnetic field is a lot higher, and you also have a higher, the planet receives a higher radiative flux. Remember, flux decay is equal to 1 over r squared. So the second uh, lesson is that closing planets experience overall a much harsher environment from their stars. Now, if you put the two things together, the harsher environment for closing planets and the harsher environment of younger stars, you can think that younger closing planets have a very... Uh, uh hard time uh, evolving at the beginning of their life. So that is the outline of my talk. So let me, I, I I'll first talk a little bit about radio emission, and uh, then I'll talk about atmospheric scape, and then uh, th in this part I'll talk more about the stellar wind, in this type, type st part I'll talk more about the scape of the planet, and then in this last part I'm gonna combine the first two. So in terms of uh, radio emission, um, I will focus on two types of emissions. One is the emission that could would come directly from your planet. We call this auroral emission. And the second one is an emission that will come from the star, but is induced by a planet. And as you're going to see, they have similar processes. So let me first talk about the emission from the planet magnetic field itself. So you have here another uh, um, illustration or movie showing how the solar wind interacts with the Earth magnetosphere. And what you see here is that as the solar wind comes from the left-hand side, it also uh, forces the night side magnetic field lines in the night side of the planet to get closer to each other. Eventually they reconnect, they release particles in this reconnection, and these particles spiral along the magnetic field line. So we are talking about a cyclotron, um, um, a cyclotron type of radiation. Because this, uh, this, radia this is called electron cyclotron major instability, but the key word here is cyclotron. Because this is, em uh, is occurring at, um, this is a cyclotron process, so you can very easily measure the frequency of the emission, if you can measure, you can very easily then convert this frequency into a magnetic field of the planet. So for example, you are expecting emission to be between 3 and 30 megahertz for a planet of about 1 or 10 Gauss field. Now, if you look in the solar system, you look at the radio power the planets of the solar system are emitting as a function of the power that is incident uh, on this planet from the solar wind. It looks like there is a, a linear relationship. So the the this black uh, dots here, they are actually extrapolation of the, the solar system observations to the region where we think the hot Jupiters would lie. So the prediction made many, a few decades ago, even before this, pa this paper, was that if you have a hot Jupiter, this hot Jupiter will emit a lot more of radio power than the largest emitter in the solar system, which is Jupiter. So we should look for this emission, right? Um, the problem is that uh, we have looked, we could not find uh, nothing very conclusive there, except maybe one paper. 
But one of the the the, the, the points is: is it possible that the way we are just extrapolating the solar wind conditions to every star in the universe is correct? Uh, maybe that's what uh, we want to look in more details. So. One way that we deal with that in, in, in my group is we do numerical simulation. And the simulations we do, they are uh, essentially magnetic hydrodynamic simulations. And I have here an illustration of the three simulations we did for one particular star. So this is a K-dwarf. It's a very famous star, has a very famous hot Jupiter. Uh, and what you have on the top here are magnetic field measurements of the stellar um, uh, surface. So you have the measurements done at about a year apart. So this is 2013, 2014, 2015. And these on the bottom are the simulations. So we use these magnetic field maps as boundary condition for our simulation. So every, sim every simulation here is identical, except for the conditions on the star that change it. And what happens is that, so what you're looking is the star, the magnetic field of the star, and also we have uh, the orbital distance as to guide our eyes for this particular hot Jupiter. And the white part here is the Alvin surface. I'll come back to this in a minute. The color indicates the speed of your wind. So as you can see, depending on the geometry and the, and the intensity of the magnetic field, the, the properties of the stellar wind change. As I told you before, the stellar wind is powering, it could power this radio emission. So we could then, in, in theory, extract the values of the stellar wind, calculate what is the power dissipated in the, in the magnetosphere of the planet, and then predict what is the radio emission. And that's what my student, so this is Robert Kavanagh's work. Uh, so he's a, a final month PhD student, I should say. <laughs> and what you have here is the peak flux density, the radio emission he predicts for this particular planet for the different epochs where we studied the stellar wind. And this is the detection limit of LOFAR. Now, I have to tell you a secret. We have LOFAR observations, and we don't find any emission, and there but we do predict higher uh, values. So there is a question that um, is it what, what is wrong, right? So if, if the observations don't catch what we predict, is there something preventing the escape of the, 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 the radio emission or generation of the radio emission from this planet? And the list of what could go wrong is really long. <laughs> and one of the points I would like to say is that the this emission occurs along the, the walls of a cone. So you can only see this emission when the cone crosses your uh, line of sight. Therefore, if you are not looking or if you're not monitoring, you might miss this, this, this emission. And I say that because very recently there has been um, uh, observations with low far at low frequency of this uh, uh, hot Jupiter around Taubu and um, well of, of the system. And they actually find, uh, they actually find a, a, a bump. So they actually detect something coming from the system. The authors are, are very careful to not say it's, it is, is a planet for sure, but that's very that was very positive, and they, they, they say that they need follow up. But if this is really an emission coming from the planet, that will be the first one we see, and that would also give us more uh, um, information about the magnetic field of the planet, because from the 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 the, the uh, frequency you observe, you can then recover the magnetic field strength. So this is the first type of radio emission. There is a second type that I would like to, to talk as well, which is the planet inducing the emission on the star. Now the, the situation is a little different because what you have here is the planet much closer in, and, uh, and the situation is similar to Jupiter and Io, but instead of Jupiter we have a star, instead of Io we have a planet. And as this planet travels around the magnetosphere, uh, within the magnetosphere of the star, essentially it shakes things up and you start to create uh, waves, you start to induce waves that they, they propagate and they dissipate energy. And as they do that, then you see uh, radio emission as well. So you have essentially particles here spiraling along the, the magnetic field of your star. So you are inducing 
the planet is inducing emission on the star. So the emission doesn't come from the planet, but is induced by the planet. And again, this is a cyclotron process. Now, the same formula I used before where the, cyc the cyclotron frequencies depend on the magnetic field holds here, but before we had the magnetic field of the planet and now we have the magnetic field of the star. So again, if you observe this emission at a certain frequency, you can recover the stellar magnetic field or the other way around. If you have the magnetic field of the star, you can then infer where this emission is going to fall. And we have actually uh, some recent detections of this, what we, we believe could be planet-induced emission. So this is an, M, uh, an M dwarf. Uh, so the emission is highly polarized. And what, what uh, we think is that uh, this emission is consistent with a planet with a sh one to five day orbit. But again, there is no confirmed planet in the system. So it could be, could not be. Another one is uh, around Proxima C. Now we, we know that there is a planet in the system, and the authors um, uh, argue that they see extra emission at qu uh, when the planet is at quadrature. So these are potential detections of this planet-induced emission. And in terms of a survey, like uh, what I'm showing you here is an X-ray luminosity of your star versus the, luminos the radio luminosity. And usually what you expect is this, this the X-ray and the radio luminosity to follow this line. But, m but with LOFAR, people are starting to find stars that are, there are too luminous in radio compared to their X-ray. So if you, if you pick, for example, a value here of X-ray 10 to 28 ergs per second, you would predict a radio luminosity on this amount more or less. But you see that there are a lot of points here that are showing much more radio emission than predicted. And the sources that are quiescent, so they, they are not very active. So one of the, the promising explanation is that these stars could have uh, emission that extra excess radio emission that is induced by a planet. And we actually did some uh, simulations looking at two M dwarfs. So this is the Proxima Centauri that I already mentioned before. And this is Eumic. Eumic is a very young, it's about 20 something million years old. And again, we, we did a similar uh, process. So you have a magnetic mat that is used as a boundary condition and also helps to drive your, your wind. And you have uh, here at the bottom the stellar wind. Now, uh, the Alvin surface is shown here as a cut in the equatorial plane. So this surface is a very weird surface. Uh, it's not like a nice uh, smooth surface around the, the planet. Essentially it tells us within the surface the magnetic energy dominates and outside the surface is the kinetic energy that dominates. Okay, So magnetic inside, m kinetic outside. So essentially what we have here is an orbital uh, the, the scale of the orbit of these planets. And the key point for you to compare is the, the planet orbit, the size of the planet orbit, and the size of the Alvin surface. You see here that the orbit of the planet is completely outside the surface, but in this case, the orbit of the planet is inside the surface. Now, this type of emissions that I was talking about can only happen if the planet is orbiting within the Alvin surface. So you need a magnetic, you need a connection between your star and your planet. So in this connection only happens if you can, you if you can transport information back to the star. So if the planet is orbiting at the super alphavanic regime, this information is never going to get back to the star. So in this case, in according to our models, Proxima B could not induce radio emission in the, in the, um, in, in, in the corona of the star. However, both planets B and C for AUMIC could induce radio emission. So, of course, uh, we, we it depends. This is a bit dependent on the model you're using and also the assumptions you made. And I have here highlighted that this only occurs for this particular mass loss rate that we modeled. And if you look closely uh, to this system, what you have here is the planet orbiting around the star, and there is a magnetic field line that connects the planet. And, and the star as it goes through the orbit. And the line disappears essentially because we are just wanting to, to demonstrate that outside this Alvin surface, the connection, the information uh, is lost. 
So this emitting field line, we know it has to obey this particular, if you have, if you remember your undergrad uh, uh, courses, the cyclotron frequency has to be above the plasma frequency for emission to occur. And, and, and this means that there is only, because the cyclotron frequency is proportional to the magnetic field and the plasma frequency is proportional to the square root of the density, you can actually draw a relationship between the two. So I advanced my slide, but let me just focus before on the on this uh, plot here. We have here a dynamic spectrum. So you have the flux density we compute for the planet as a function of the orbit, and then color coded is the frequency. And I just highlight the 140 megahertz that uh, we predict uh, that was observed with LOFAR. Now it's very funny; it's completely coincidental. But if you compare this line here with the observations of GJ1151 is a different star, a different system. They actually match, but th this is very coincidental. But the idea here of this work was to demonstrate that um, you could, from using combining simulations and observations, you can place better, more constraints in the uh, on the system. On in the f in this case, for example, we d we discussed that because there is a tight relation between magnetic field and density, the detection will give you uh, magnetic field, and therefore you can also infer the density and better characterize the mass loss rate of the star, for example. This is what I wanted to talk about uh, in the first part of my talk. Now let me move to the exoplanet bit. Is there any question so far? Yeah, that that would be very good. So ideally, you want to have a modulation to confirm that it's linked to the planet. Yeah. You, yeah, I think they are working on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need to monitor then your your star. Yeah. Right. So let me move to the second bit of the talk. Uh, so now we save all we heard about stellar winds, and now we move to planets. And what I would like to talk is on the uh, atmospheric scape. So why do we care about atmospheres? Well, there is a, a, a relevance for habitability. Uh, I want to highlight this one, though. So we want to know also how planets are evolving. And for example, if you look at the occurrence rate versus the size of the planet, you start to see that there is a depletion of small planets at particular radius. So one idea is that these planets, they were born as, a big pl as big planets, they lost mass, and they actually en end up piling up on the side of the, di on the histogram. So atmospheric losses can scope to mass radius distribution, and also it's interesting not only from perspective of development of life, but also to understand the population of planets. Well, how do we detect these atmospheres? So one, uh, this is my very quick slide on, on the observational technique. So essentially what you have here is your star, your planet is transiting in front of your star. So if you were to observe your planet in broadband light, what you're gonna see is a light curve that looks like this brown line here. A small dip in the light curve, in that uh, essentially when the planet blocks part of the light of the star. Now, if you had Lyman alpha eyes, so if your eyes could capture just uh, one particular line, so if you're observing with uh, within a certain uh, spectroscopic line, so for example here my my line is a Lyman alpha, meaning this planet is supposedly hydrogen rich, it has neutral hydrogen. Therefore, once this planet passes in front of the star, the Lyman alpha photons from the star, they can be transmitted through the atmosphere of the planet, and, there's and therefore you see a light curve. Uh, you, can, you can plot a light curve for this particular line. So what you do here, you take a spectrum of your star when the planet is out of transit, then you, you take another spectrum of the star when the planet is in front of the star, you divide the two and you find the percentage of the absorption that is linked to the atmosphere of the planet. And here is what I'm showing in blue. So this technique is called transmission spectroscopy. Now, I highlight that may if you compare the two uh, uh, um, 
light curves, you see that my blue line here is very asymmetric, and this is because the atmosphere might have a weird shape, so therefore you have a weird uh, asymmetric um, transit. And this is actually what you see, for example, around this uh, warm Neptune. So you have this star is a M dwarf, and you're looking at the transit of this planet, and this is tiny little thing here is the transit in optical light. And this big thing here is the transit when you observe your planet with Hubble. So you're looking at Lyman Alpha. There is a, a huge amount of material around this planet. The interpretation is that your planet is losing mass, and as it goes around the star, it develops this comet-like tail. And this comet-like tail is then what is absorbing the, the light of your star in Lyman Alpha, and you can estimate the escape rates in grams per second. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, so that's one idea to observe how to to directly detect atmospheres of planets. Another another uh, more um, recent way to observe evaporating atmospheres by looking at helium lines. So we are now looking at the near infrared, which is great because you can do this from the ground. You don't have to to go. To use Hubble, although one of these uh, is actually a Hubble observation, but you technically you could do this from the ground. And there is now uh, really uh, the number of detections of evaporating atmospheres in helium lines are uh, is increasing. And the common feature you actually see is that these stars they are relatively active, so you still need some EUV um, photons to lift the atmosphere so it can evaporate. Now I mentioned about detection, but what is the physics behind that? So the idea here is that you, you, you have uh, a planet, you have a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, and you need en high-energy photons to ionize this atmosphere or to partially ionize. So for example, you have a photon that has an energy greater than the ionization threshold of hydrogen, 13.6 eV. Therefore, what happens is that you use 13.6 eV to ionize, and the excess energy is essentially used to convert, is converted into thermal motions, and this raises the temperature of your, the atmosphere of your planet. Now, if you, if you increase the temperature, it means the atmosphere expands, and if the atmosphere expands, it's more easy, it's easier for the planet than to lose atmosphere. So this process is actually called photoevaporation. And we use uh, hydrodynamic equations to model this photoevaporation because these are so dense that we can actually treat this as a fluid that is in escape. And uh, I just want to highlight some of the works that don was done by uh, people who worked with me. So again, I, I bring again the plot of the evolution of the high energy. Now you understand why I was so focused on the high energy at the beginning of the talk. And uh, what you see here is the effect of escape in the evolution of your planet. Now, for people doing massive star evolution, you know that the, your star is losing mass, and uh, the amount of mass the star is lost will affect the track the star is going to take in your HR diagram. This is very similar, it's just that we don't have an HR diagram for the planets. But here is essentially you, you have one case that we studied. So this is a, a small planet. So the planet is born with a seven planetary uh, Earth radii, and you have no escape. So the planet would, in theory, ev evolve like this. Uh, but if you actually take into account a hydrodynamic escape, so you add, you remove atmosphere of your planet, then the evolution it would do it the track it will follow is the one that show is shown by the uh, red line. Now this is actually uh, computation is done with a code that was originally developed to study stellar evolution. Uh, so the code is public. The if you have used it before, you can download your the in lists and you can actually evolve your own planet. Uh, I am going to ignore the black line for now, but. The bottom line here is that escape can affect the internal structure of the planet as you start to remove mass. And the other thing that uh, uh, I would like also to show, so this, is this was work done for a small planet, but here is a more massive planet. It's also a closing planet. 
So you can simulate the, the you can calculate the amount of evaporation the planet, uh, the amount of mass the planet loses at each instant of its life. And if you plot the evaporation rate as a function of age, uh, the three lines here, again, they, they are related to whether the star was born as a fast rotator or a slow rotator, but I'm not going to go in that direction here in this talk. But if you just pick one line, for example, the blue line, and if you integrate this line, so you have grams per second here, and then you have time here, you can actually get a total mass. So this is the total mass the planet lost in the evolution. So if the planet is really big, the reservoir is really big. So it sometimes you, you it, it doesn't affect much. But if the planet is small, the reservoir is limited, so it can affect quite a lot your planet. Now, in this case here, we estimate a 20% mass was lost through the evolution of this planet. And if you have a hot Jupiter with a more massive planet, then the total, although the mass loss rate is really strong, it's really high, the total amount of mass might not be so high. Now, what are another thing that we did in this work here, we actually transited the planet, right? So we, we wanted to, we essentially have a ray tracing uh, tool that you, you, you put the planet in front of the star, you shoot rays of, I don't know, Lyman alpha photons or H alpha photons, and you see how much is absorbed. And this is the spectral line you expect when the planet is in front of the star. Now, what I show here on the, on the y-axis is the amount of flux that the line is absorbing, uh, that is absorbed, and this is a function of the velocity for the Lyman alpha and the H alpha line. And the color here indicates the age. So the young planet has a uh, darker color and the older planet has lighter color. Now, for the Lyman alpha, you see the line is completely saturated. It essentially, uh, the atmosphere of the planet absorbs all the light of the star at the central velocity here. Uh, it is also broader uh, as the planet is y for younger planets. And the H alpha is another line that could be very promising because you can also observe from the ground. Uh, the problem with H alpha is that the star has also emits H alpha, so you never know if the emission is coming from the planet or it's coming if the absorption from the planet or something from the star. So it's more difficult to disentangle the two. But one of the things I want to highlight is that both cases here, the line profiles, they are symmetric around the zero, which is not what we observe. So the problem here is that we are looking at 1D models that only, uh, that essentially assumes that the, the atmosphere is axisymmetric, which in theory it's not, because the atmosphere is not only escaping it's into vacuum, but is also being shaped by the stellar wind. So you have the X-ray and the UV radiation that hits the atmosphere, but then you have the stellar wind that shapes this outflow. So what I want to talk about now in this last bit is how the stellar wind interact with the atmosphere of the planet. And for that, we are developing uh, a framework that essentially combines what I said in the first part of the talk with what I said in the second part of the talk. And let me show you what this framework is. Um, you have here at the center your planet then these lines in black are velocity streamlines of the evaporation of the atmosphere of the planet. And then in, in this boundary here, we are injecting the stellar wind. So the stellar wind lines, the streamlines are shown here by the gray or white lines. And you also have a density here in the equatorial plane. So if you want to do this, um, properly, you, you want to move in, in, in 3D. So the, the shadow here is the sonic surface. And I'll come back to the sonic surface a bit more uh, now. So let me just illustrate what, what happens. So you have your planet here. This is the atmosphere as if there was no stellar wind occurring. So you can see that the night shadow, the night side of the planet has a shadow here. So the star is towards your left the stellar wind is injected in the, uh, from the left as well. And uh, the planet is orbiting upwards. So I'm going to play this movie and you're gonna see essentially what the stellar wind does to this uh, atmosphere. 
So as the simulation evolves, you see that there is uh, some distinct uh, characteristics in the planet now. So one of them is that you form a tail, and this tail is shaped by the interaction with the wind and by the orbital motion. So it's a vector sum. So that's why you end up with a tail in this diagonal here. You also form a bow shock if the velocities are supersonic. So you end up forming a bow shock around your planet. So conclusion is that stellar irradiation and the stellar wind can shape the atmosphere and the evaporation of your planet. And this is one work that a um, former student of mine did. What we are looking here is, so these are all 3D simulations, but it's hard to visualize in 3D. So what we do is do some cuts, and this is looking at the equatorial plane. Again, the wind comes from the left, and what the question was, how is the atmosphere of the planet affected if the stellar wind is stronger? Remember I told you that in the past we think the stellar wind was stronger uh, for stars similar to the sun. So if you, if you uh, look at this, this is the planet. For each, each um, box here, I have a different mass loss, rate mass loss rate for the wind. So this is twice the value of the solar wind mass loss rate. 10 times and 20. So you're increasing the stellar wind mass loss rate from left to right. And the color indicates the density. Now this really tiny circle here is the sonic surface of the planet. So the planet starts to accelerate, essentially it has a, an escaping wind. So the wind starts to accelerate as it moves upwards. And eventually, it goes from subsonic velocities to supersonic velocities. And it, go it, it crosses this boundary at the circle here. You also have shock formation, and there you, you have a double shock structure. But let's only focus on for now on the sonic surface around the planet. Now, you see that as we increase the, the mass loss rate of the stellar wind, this initial uh, circular uh, symmetric surface is actually being disrupted. And what we, we realized is that the stronger the stellar wind is, the first of all, very obvious here by the colors, you, are, you start to see the atmosphere of the planet it occupies a smaller volume. And the second thing we notice is that once the surface becomes what we call here undisturbed to open or disrupted, once the surface opens up, the escape rate of the planet actually goes down. And this is, uh, we can come back to this later, but, uh, but I, want, um, I would like to more focus more on the observational signatures. So you have here the escape rate of each of the simulations we run, and this is the Lyman alpha absorption. Now, because the line is saturated at the center, and we also can't observe this line from, from, from the center of the line from, from the Earth, or with Hubble, for example, we are just looking at the blue and the red wings, so we are just summing the, the, co the, the, the blue and the red wings of the line. And these are simulations for hot Jupiter. The first cross here indicates no stellar wind. The second, cr the second point is the stellar wind, uh, the mass loss rate of the stellar wind is increasing, two, four, six, ten, so on and so forth. And what you see here is that even though you start to increase the, the amount of wind, the, the escape rate of the planet is not changing much. So the stellar wind is not eroding more the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, but what, is what, the, what the wind is actually doing, it's reducing the signature you would observe because the atmosphere is becoming more and more confined. And then eventually, at some point where we break, uh, we open up the surface of the sonic surface of the planet, you start to see this decrease in mass loss rate. Now, I had predicted a couple of years ago that this would be a drastic decrease. <laughs> and uh, when we did the simulations, the, the decrease was not so drastic. It's a, fa a factor of a few. But uh, yeah, so what we, we were not expecting is that the, 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 the it was so drastic in terms of affecting the observations. Now, this brings me to the dichotomy of uh, AU MIC. So I told you this, is this system is very young. And I said to you that if the system is young, there is a lot of high EUV emission. Therefore, this star induces a lot of escape in the planet through photoionization. 
But I also told you that if the system is young, if the stellar wind is very strong, and I just showed you that if, a if you have a strong stellar wind, you can affect the escape rate. So which, which, which one is dominating in the system? So there has been, in, in the literature, a suggestion that this star has a wind that is about 10 times the mass loss rate, 10 times that of the sun, but other work suggested that this, is this star should have a much stronger wind. So for us, a thousand times higher than solar mass loss rate is really long, a lot. So we did a number of simulations varying the mass loss rate of the sun. And again, we have a similar conclusion, as I showed you before. Evaporation rate is not is strongly reduced. It's only a factor uh, of two. But if you look at the Lyman alpha absorption as, uh, as you increase the mass loss rate of the star, you're essentially changing completely the, the, the what you would detect from this planet. So the transit signatures are erased by uh, the stellar winds. So this is a bit sad because if you want to probe the wind of your star through transits, uh, you know, yeah, so the, 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 the if you want to, pr you, you it's a bit sad in a way that you can remove the, the 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 signature of the evaporation. But on the other hand, you might it might help you to 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 constrain the, the the conditions of the stellar wind if you observe a transit. Now let me move. Uh, I wanted to talk about the CME, but I, I won't have time. So let me just finish with a few slides on the last big implementation we did, which was when I was talking about the stellar winds, I mentioned a lot magnetic fields, but when I started talking about evaporation, uh, I stopped talking about magnetic fields, and this is because we were using a hydrodynamic model. So we decided that we should take into account the magnetic field of the planet, at least to understand if there is any role the magnetic field would play. Uh, we think there, there, there is, but anyway, we, we, we started doing the simulations. So this is again your planet, but now the lines here indicate the magnetic field of the planet. And there are some key differences between escape without magnetic field and now atmospheric escape with magnetic fields. And two, um, two, fit two, two, two features you see here is that the planet creates a dead zone. So essentially there is an area around the planet uh, where material is not escaping. So the wind is actually, the atmospheric escape is, is, is weaker in the equatorial reg region because of the magnetic field lines there. And the other thing is that you end up creating a polar flow in the North Pole and you don't see it, but there is another flow also, another flow in the, in the, in the South uh, Hemisphere which means that instead of having a one comet-like tail, now you actually have two tails, one coming from each hemisphere of your planet. So the magnetic field changes the dynamics of the escaping atmosphere, and we see in our simulations the formation of two tails. So just to show you again, this is a, one d a 2D cut of the simulations for a planet without magnetic field and a planet with a 10 gauss magnetic field. And you see here the neutral, um, the neutral density. You see this is the one tail structure we had before, and now this is the two tail structures. And I, I, I thought it was interesting. If you imagine that you have, you s if you look carefully, there is actually a difference in the geometry of the tail in the north and in the south hemisphere, and this is because of the way it interacts with the magnetic field of the star. But let's say if your planet is transiting, is grazing in the southern part of the star or is grazing in the northern part of the star, different amount of, of uh, um, absorption you will occur. So you could eventually even have like different, um, different absorptions depending on the impact parameter of the planet. But this is just like a, it's, it's like playground for the theorists. I don't think you would ever <laughs> observe such a thing. <laughs> but anyway, so one thing we did was Let's compute what is the evaporation rate for this planet as the dipolar field strength is increased. And if you just focus on the total amount of scape, you see that actually you are increasing the scape for uh, as you increase the magnetic field of the planet. Now, it's not a, s a huge increase, 
So there is a weak increase in escape rates with the increasing magnetic field of the planet. But what was again more importantly is that you shape the you you the dynamics of the the, the system uh, changes, and you you end up affecting quite significantly the observational signature. So again, this is a Lyman alpha line for a 10 Gauss field in purple and a zero Gauss field or no magnetic field for uh, the the red curve. So again, there is you see that there is a lot more absorption at line center for high magnetic fields and more absorption for in the blue wing for um, no magnetic field. So you can also see that there is a, an effect here depending on the strength of your magnetic field. Now, that was the last bit I wanted to talk about. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, the interaction between stellar winds and exoplanets can generate radio emission. So one is the radio Bode's law, so the same relationship I showed you for the solar system. Another one is the induced uh, emission from the planet in the corona of the star. Escape of planetary atmosphere depends on the evolution of the, 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 the XUV emission, the high energy em emission of the host star. And the last bit here I mentioned is that the stellar wind can reduce escape uh, and unfortunately could erase the signatures in Lyman alpha observations when you look at the system, especially when they are young. And I did not mention much about the CMEs. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in, in the future. But what we see is that these this bursty events, they can also affect momentarily the uh, evaporation of the, the atmosphere of the planet. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention, guys. Thank you very much, Aline. Very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? Hi, Alin. Thank you for the talk. Um, you were talking about sonic surfaces for the planetary escape. Uh, and I was wondering at what altitude uh, do you find these? And if you could be so kind to translate that into pressures, that uh -huh. would be even better. <laughs> you. You. This, this, is your this is payback for me asking you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, okay, the, the, the sonic surfaces are around, it depends on the temperature of your atmosphere at the end, but maybe a few, a few planetary radius, uh, planetary like two, three planetary radii. Now, I, I don't know the pressure, I, well, I know where to find it, but I have to consult. But the other problem I have is that I can only give you the pressure in dynes per centimeter squared. <laughs> Thanks, I mean, uh, very nice talk. I, this is just out of curiosity, and perhaps I, I, I missed it. When you talked about the atmospheric escape, I mean, you show very nice correlations with, or I mean, that it depends on the X-ray luminosity, which goes down, and the, the, the EUV, of course, as well. But shouldn't it also be a very strong function of the distance from the, from, from the star, right? I didn't see, or perhaps I missed yeah. it. Yeah, you you yeah. discussed this, particularly when you show it in your you know, evolution models, it must mm -hmm. depend very critically on the distance yeah. you put yeah, yeah, yeah. your planet, mm -hmm. or... Yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So the curves I showed you, I should have said, it was for a fixed, it was for one planet evolving at a fixed orbital distance. Right. But uh, if you go to Darius uh, Kubishikina's paper, mm -hmm. you see she has a bunch of different models for different distances, different stars, diff you know, there is she yeah. y really has like a grid of models. And of course, I the further you are from your star, the less radiation you get, and therefore you expect less evaporation. Mm. Mm -hmm. So for example, I don't know, perhaps it's not favorable, but if you have like hot Jupiters, like <laughs> some are studying, which are very, very close, mm -hmm. uh, intuitively I would just expect such system to have a very big atmospheric escape that, I mean, in, in terms of ionization, because they're so close, so there should be a lot of UV photons entering. I don't know if there has been any yeah, yeah, studies yeah. of such very close yeah, by yeah. systems or not. Yeah, uh, yeah, usually that's exactly what you see. The, the, the planets that are, there are, they are bigger, they have lower gravity, and they are closer to the star, they receive more radiation, they, es they escape more. 
So if the planet becomes, if you have a planet, if, if you bring this planet further out, evaporation rates will decrease. And also if you make this planet with a higher gravity, then you hold on to the atmosphere more. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did not show the complete picture, but yes, we have models with different gravities and different distances. And that's, that's what you see. Closing low gravity, lose more. Yeah. yeah. But it's very intuitive at the end of the day, yeah. right? Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. I am a, a binary star person. Did you ever consider doing the same exercise around a, a binary? Looking at uh, the impact of the wind of a binary star on a circumbinary planet? <laughs> I haven't, uh, but, but yeah, no, I haven't. <laughs> I would need a, another. Would you expect a difference? Yeah, I think there, there are, there are. Depends on where the planet is. Is the planet in certain binary circum orbit, binary or is yeah. the planet orbiting one star only? No, a circum. Oh, well, uh, whatever. You know, whatever you like. Yeah, you, you are yeah. the theoretician, mm -hmm. so you can place yeah. the planet where you like. So <laughs> yeah. So I think it, it, it will. My guess is that it will depend on on. Which region of influ which which star influences more the planet in terms of its wind, but of course there is a lot of work on on the dynamics of si such systems where like where the planet if the planet is in circumbinary orbit uh -huh. or is only orbiting one of the binary. The, 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 the wind structure in a, in a binary star right mm -hmm. uh, will be different because if they mm -hmm. die, I mean there may be regions of the winds that are MMs maybe to due to a collision uh, there will be regions that are depleted. Yeah. So there may be, I don't know. There yeah, no, no, I, I, I think there, there is certainly going to be variations at the exactly different yeah. par point of the orbit. You can also think, the way I also think, you could also think of a planet in an elliptical orbit, right? So if you, you yeah. also have different wind conditions when you are at a pastron or uh, periastron. So I, I suspect it's, it would be something, uh, some sort, similar sort of, of variations, but of course you, it's it's a fun project, I would say. You know, <laughs> if you can, if you can, you could, you could in theory get like take a system that uh, that you know there, there is a circumbinary planet. Uh, if you have, you can play, you can have like a uh, the stellar wind of both stars, and you can just investigate how that. Yeah, you go and you can start with a mock uh, yeah, simulation, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And see, see whether there could be anything. Yeah. So. yeah, I'm not familiar with work doing ev looking at evaporation. Yeah, it's a fun project. <laughs> it's, it looks doable, right? I, I think it's a doable project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, 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 because the, 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 <laughs> the people online may not hear you. So for the last results that you were showing where you have the interaction of the planetary outflow with a magnetic field and the stellar magnetic field, are these for the case where the planet is, uh, the orbit of the planet is inside or outside the alphane surface of the star? Yeah, the, the, yeah, it's actually outside. It's, it's super alphavenic. Okay. Uh, we have issues in simulating super alphavenic. <laughs> okay. Just because we're injecting the wind, and if we inject a super alphavenic orbit, the boundary misbehave. But yeah, so th th those were all super alphavenic. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Dirty secret. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question because Evelyn has to, to catch a train. I still have time. Thank you. Um, so my imp I got the impression it's, uh, it's all for hot Jupiters. Uh, so these are very gaseous mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at this Lyman alpha line, so this was almost saturated mm -hmm. in absorption. So this made me wonder, by just looking at the uh, Lyman alpha absorption profile, could one distinguish between a gaseous planet and a rocky planet, ah. which has a, a much less atmosphere mm -hmm. to escape away? Yeah. I think people usually target the gas giants for these observations because they don't expect to find uh, anything or no, not uh, something that is detectable. But what I would say is that if you have a, um, a rocky planet with a thinner atmosphere, it becomes more di observationally more difficult to detect. Um, but in theory, they, they could also absorb. Yeah. 
a lot less that they could still absorb. And but the the issue with the Ly Lyman alpha observation is that there is the geochronal emission and the ISM absorption. So you you don't use anything in the center of the line. So you only have information from the winds, and and it becomes even more difficult if if. So probably a lot of those lines are all saturated at s the center, but we just don't see it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, I think that we will leave it as this. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, you thank you, Herr Thank you.